If you uh, want to look in the Chumash on page 820, the parasha begins, Vayikach Korach ben Yitzar ben Gahas ben Levi, Vedasam Aviram ben Eliyah, Vayim ben Pelas ben Eruven. The parasha begins that Korach took, and by Korach we mean the son of Yitzar, the son of Gahas, the son of Levi, and notably Yaakov is left out. And Dasan and Aviram, the sons of Eliav, and On Bempelas, all from the tribe of Reuven. Now, what happens sometimes in other languages is that you can have a run on sentence. You can have a sentence that can go on for a while, and you still feel like you're hanging on that sentence until the sentence will finally finish. In English, that's not allowed. If you go more than a, a, a sentence or two and it feels too long, somehow you've got to cut it down and chop it up into parts. But what happens when you have a language that doesn't require that is that sometimes you have the opening of a sentence and it never closes. And that's what you have here at the beginning of Parsha's Korach, in where it says, Vayikach Korach, and Korach took, and it never says what he took. The Parsha just carries on and says, and they stood up before Moshe, him, and the 250 men. But it doesn't say, it doesn't finish that opening sentence of Vayikach Korach and Korach took. So the question is, Korach took what? So Rashi has a very interesting way of beginning the Parsha. Rashi, Vayikach Korach says, Parsha zu Yafa Nidreshes Bemidrash Rabbi Tanchuma. This parsha is beautifully expounded upon in the Midrash of Rabbi Tanchuma. Uh, Rashi's job is usually to explain the verses, not generally to cite some other source and tell you, you want to see some really nice explanations on this, go see this Midrash. Especially not to start the parsha that way. So the Sifse Chachamim explains. There's a famous Rashi in Parshas Bereshis, where Rashi says his exact words are, Ani lo basi shel mikra. I have come to give the simple explanation of the verse, where Rashi kind of all the way at the beginning of the Torah tells you what his job is going to be. And I'll bring in the Agadaic teachings the stories that our sages fill in, in order to help us understand the, the verses. Or Rabbi Nutam, Rashi's grandson, once quipped, he said, Rashi wrote the most brilliant commentary on all of Talmud Bavli, almost all of Talmud Bavli. Uh, and without the Talmud Bavli, the Rash, um, without Rashi, the Talmud Bavli would be um, inaccessible to us. Let's put it uh, simply that way. As a matter of fact, uh, there are others who have said that they don't understand how Rashi could possibly have written his commentary on the Bavli without Rashi. So th th that's brilliant. So Rabbeinu Tam said, his grandson, he said, I think I could have done a job almost as good as Rashi on writing a commentary on the Bavli but I could never have done Rashi's commentary on the Chumash. Because in the Chumash it's so concise, and he includes so much, and he picks and chooses from the words of our sages what to say, what not to say. That's what Rashi's telling you at the beginning of the Torah. I'm just coming to give you a way that you can read the Chumash and get an explanation and come out with it with a basic understanding of what our sages want from the Torah. And it's amazing that Rashi says that, and he plans that, and that's what Rashi comes out with. And what... The joke on us is that there are 11 major super commentaries on Rashi and hundreds of super, super commentaries on discussing those commentaries to the point where Rashi provides so much depth in all the little nuances in his language that if you analyze, you see that even though the simple reader sees a simple explanation, the more expert reader will find the more complex explanation and the more... Um, the more advanced you are, the more difficult it is to try to understand what Rashi was really trying to say in the way that he adjusts and changes things. Incredibly. Anyway, but Rashi, over here, begins the parsha with, you know what? You want a really good explanation on the parsha? Read the Medrash Tanchum. So the Sivsa Chachamim explains that because Rashi is usually coming to explain the pshat, the simple reading, you can't have a simple reading here. Because you can't finish the sentence. Vayikach Korach and Korach took. 
and it doesn't say what he took. So therefore, Rashi has to say, this is a beautiful explanation, there's a beautiful explanation of this in the Midrash Tanachuma, meaning, I don't have pshat for you, I'll give you the Midrash. And then Rashi goes on to quote the Midrash. That just shows you how difficult this verse is to understand. And then Rashi does quote the Medrash Tanchum on this part and gives two explanations for Vayikach Korach. The first is based on Unkelas. If you look at the commentary of Unkelas, Unkelas says, the Ispaleg Korach. Korach um, separated himself. So Vayikach doesn't, shouldn't translate as he took, but um, Vayikach means he... Um, What's the right word? Himself. Right. Well, he took himself. Out of, out of but it doesn't say that in the verse, right? right? So he, uh, what would be the right word? To, to pull out of the union. To remove. Right. To remove oneself. But to secede from the... Right. right. To see, so Korach seceded would be the best translation. The problem with this is the word Vayikach means and he took. If he took himself, it should say Vayukach. Korach, which you could, you could, uh, with there's no nekudos, uh, you could technically midrash it or darshan it that way, but the simple reading is Vayikach and he took something else. So Rashi offers the second explanation that Vayikach Korach refers to the leaders of the Sanhedrin cited later. The problem is it doesn't read well in the verse either because it's Korach, the son of Yitzhak, the son of Kahas, the son of Levi, and took and Dasan and Aviram and Omen Pelas, and they stood before Moshe and all the men of the Jewish people, all in, uh, in uh, uh, I guess, almost parentheses, the 250 men. That's very hard to read that as the simple reading of the verse. And therefore Rashi sort of, if I may say, throws in the towel here and says, let's work with the Midrash. This is just the first two words in the, in the Parsha. And we're already, we're already stuck. So, let's turn to the Pashtanim, to the rabbis who always have the Pshat explanation, starting with the Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra wants to suggest that it's a shortened verse. Vayikach Korach, and he took people. Except the word people is missing, but sometimes the verse can be short. But... That's hard to accept because we believe that Torah is Hashem Tamima, the Torah is perfect. And unless there's a reason to be short, which Ibn Ezra doesn't give, um, why would the Torah leave out what he took? The subject of the verse is missing. So the Ramban wants to suggest a different translation for the word Vayikach. He says Vayikach is Shalakach Eitza Balibo, that he took an idea, he took counsel with himself, and he, he says that Lekicha to take can also be translated as took to mind or considered. So he, he would be translating Vayikach Korach, very difficult, but that's when the Ramban explains, Vayikach Korach, that Korach considered, contemplated, decided, took counsel with himself, and took the following, uh, went through the following process. Again, a very difficult explanation. Because why here, of all places, would the Torah choose to not use a word that would be more clear that the Torah has words for when someone decided, or someone chose, or someone believed or thought? So the Rush and other commentaries offer a very novel explanation. They say that Korach is showing a lot of chutzpah in the parsha, Coming before Moshe and saying, I think that uh, maybe you've uh, done all this on your own. Hashem didn't tell you. You picked your brother. I see some nepotism here. You're making all these claims against, against Moshe. So it comes from chutzpah. So the verse is trying to tell you where Korach got the audacity from. And the answer is, because Korach held himself to be a man of yichus, a man of importance, a man of great lineage, deserving of honor for his own sake. And therefore, this is how the Rush and other Mephoshim read, Vayikach Korach, Korach took, 
the fact that he was ben Yitzhar ben Kahas ben Levi, he took those things and stood up and came before Moshe. Uh, th these are the Rishonim. These are the Rishonim who are here to give the simple explanation of the verse. And they all kind of have to force the translation of the verse. All very clever, unique, novel explanations. And all true. Elu ve'elu divra elu kim chayim. But they all are missing the the answer to why would the Torah be so unclear in this parsha specifically, whatever the explanation may be, they're all fitting it in. Once the question is already there, why does the Torah state Vayikach Korach and doesn't tell us what Korach took? So if I may, we'd like to delve into the deeper explanations. And I find it interesting sometimes that you think that the simple explanations are going to cover all the basic questions, and then the deeper explanations sort of go away from the simple reading of the verse. But sometimes you'll find that, for example, the Zohar will take a verse which we read as metaphor and actually read it more literal than the Pshat does. Because sometimes when you go to a deeper level in, in the verse, you end up with a clearer explanation. And um, it, it resolves the questions even on that level. So if I may, some of this is pretty deep stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's just uh, try to work through it. Mm -hmm. uh, once more, let me just, um, let me just reiterate so just that so we keep track of it. Rashi had his two explanations. The first was that Korach was Ispaleg, based on Onkelos. He seized seceded. Then you have um, the second explanation of Rashi, that he took the Chachamim, he took the Rashi Sanhedrin, then you have a break in the verse. We had the Ebenezer who says that the verse is short, it's just missing the subject. We had the Ramban who said that he took counsel with himself, and the Rush that he took his Yichus. That's the summary of, there's other explanations, but those are the major, major explanations. So, the um, Reb Tzvi Elamelech of Dinov, who's the author of the Bnei Yisachar, wrote a commentary on the Torah called Agra de Kala. And in Agra de Kala, he has 19 explanations on Vayikach Korach. So I'd like to, if we may, try to get through three of them. They're all, they string together nicely, so hopefully we can get through them all. The first is in the realm of Musr. The Yetzirah, for some people, and even within each person, you have different Yetzirahs. The Yetzirah will sometimes tell you to do a bad thing. To um, you know, miss a mitzvah, to speak negatively about someone else, to uh, um, not eat kosher, whatever the, your particular, everyone has their Yetzirahs, where the Yetzirah actually tells you to do a bad thing. And you know you're doing a bad thing. And as a Hashem, we work on ourselves, we may become better people, we have uh, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur to atone for them, and we're constantly trying to become better people. If, you, uh, if you're not traveling upward, you're traveling downward. So if you're not traveling downward, you're traveling upward. No one's ever standing still. So we're working on ourselves. But you have your clear Averus that you know you have to fix, you're doing this wrong, and everyone has a plan. We're assuming, we're down the cops with everyone. You've got a plan. If you don't have a plan, you have a plan to have a plan. <laughs> Those are actually easier to work with. I know I have a problem. I'm not so good at keeping kosher. And so I'm going to work on it. I'll stop being so into food and I'll stop hanging out with those people who don't eat kosher. And eventually I'll get there. The most dangerous area is where the Yetzirah tells you to do something because it's a mitzvah. This you need to do. This is a good thing. You should get excited about this action. That person needs to be punished and removed from society, or that person needs to be uh, told off and needs to be made into a better person, and no one else is going to do it, and I'm doing the world a favor. 
This is, uh, it, everyone's got some of those. Everyone's got their thing where they've said either, even if they haven't gone so far to make it a mitzvah, but for me, it's not so bad. It's an okay thing for me. Everyone has those. Says the, says the, uh, the Bnei Yisrael, the Agra, the Kala, that's that more dangerous Yetzirah. The problem is, I'm stuck. If the Yetzirah tells me it's a mitzvah, how do I know it isn't? When I'm doing an Avera, so I know, listen, I did the Avera so I can make myself better. But if he tells me this is a mitzvah, that person needs to be told off. And, and it isn't, because it's just, it's really me wanting to put that person down or wanting to um, you know, stand up for my own honor and I want to look good. So, so how do I know? So the Baal Shem Tov gives us a clue. He says, measure the excitement and the inspiration that you feel towards this action. If you have any mitzvahs that you fulfill with the same level of inspiration and excitement, then it might be a mitzvah. But if you're more excited about this than you are about any of the other mitzvahs, if you're more into it, then that means it's just the Yetzirah trying to entice you to do it. So I'm not... Uh, let me give an example. Let's say there's a certain movement that there are certain people who feel that they're excluded from being able to perform certain mitzvahs. They want to be able to perform these mitzvahs. They feel they're excluded from um, uh, certain mitzvahs. Let's say the Jews in Chutz Laaretz are feel like they're left out because they, they're not in Eretz Yisrael. They don't get to perform the mitzvahs of Truma and Miser. So we decide, no, we're going to fight and we're going to fulfill the mitzvahs of Trumas and Misers. So, what kind of tones do I use when I speak about my desire to fulfill that mitzvah? Do I talk about how the people in Eretz Yisrael are prejudiced against Chutz Laaretzniks, and how the whole Torah is trying to force us to live in certain countries and not in other countries? Do I take on um, terms and tones of spite and... and uh, and, and self-hatred, I say by that, I mean hating other Jews. So if it does take on that excitement and inspiration that I don't have for other mitzvahs, so then that means that it's not coming from a good place, it's not coming from your Yetzir Tov, it's coming from your Yetzir Hara. That's what the Baal Shem Tov said. That's the key. Measure your excitement and how, how much you're willing to run around with flyers and, and um, YouTube videos about your cause. And if you're willing to do the same thing for your desire to fulfill the mitzvahs that you uh, that you that are without question mitzvahs. Then you can know that you're in a good place. That's what the that's what the Baal Shem Tov says. Now, what happens? What happens if a person does measure and sees that he's more excited about this particular cause than he is about mitzvahs in general? So, what should he do? What should that person do? What? Well, no, I know. I know what it is. I know that I'm, I'm running after this mitzvah. Let's say the mitzvah that I'm running after is to punish a certain person. A certain person committed a certain terrible, uh, treacherous deed. And I'm out to punish him, putting up uh, flyers everywhere. This person is a thief and a liar. And, this guy. and I'm doing it with Shem Shemayim. I need to protect the community. Then I measure myself and I see... That, you know, I'm not putting up flyers for people to be uh, not speaking Ashan Hara or people to be um, davening better. So why am I putting up flyers about this person being a thief and people should avoid? Why am I getting so excited about it? So I say to myself, you know what? It's a Yetzirah. That guy insulted me once and now I want to take my vengeance. So what should I do now? So he says that if you do find yourself in that state, you abandon the mitzvah. Even though there might be elements of a mitzvah in it. But if where you're coming from is a place of Yetzirah that's driving you, even though there are still parts in it that might be true that are a mitzvah, if that's what's driving you, walk away from it. Didn't you once tell us that you should go the opposite, like do the opposite of... What it is? Or did I learn that story? Well, that's when you're doing something wrong. Here, here, I'm doing something. There's some, there's some right in it. 
I'm just going to an extreme, and I'm trying to convince myself that I have to go to the extreme because of the mitzvah. Now, what I could do is tone it down and bring it to a, you know, just sort of, instead of putting up a billboard that says, see this man, he's a thief. So instead of doing that, I could just, you know, tell my friends and pass around the word that this person is someone you shouldn't do yeah, business well, with. I can, what? Well, we're talking about a case where the guy is actually a thief. Uh, uh, if that's the case, you know, someone who uh, is running a Ponzi scheme, it's clear it's your responsibility to make it public. But, but how do you make it public knowledge? Do you have to uh, punish the guy? Do you have to embarrass the person? Or can you just pass it around? Whatever the case is. So he says, walk away from it. Because um, if it doesn't come from, if it comes from the Yetzir Hara, <coughs> it's going to cause more harm to you than the sin itself or the reason why you have to punish that other person is causing harm to you. What if someone with, uh, had done that with, what's his, the guy's name? Who, uh, Madoff? Madoff, yeah. What if someone went up and put up signs and kept people from losing millions of dollars. Right, so the, that would have been so terrible? No, no, not at all. You see, if people put up signs, if that's all people would do, people don't put up signs. People put up rants. And people um, punish their children and their relatives and their friends and people just um, lash out. And that comes from Yetzirah as much as it comes from Yetzirah because there is a process. You know, there's a, you have to go to the police, you have to report the person, you have to present evidence, you have to put up an announcement that says, if someone can help us protect the community, please come and help. You have to do those things. But where does that, where does the vitriol come from? And that's the Yates of Horror. So he says, walk away from it. Deal, let someone else deal with it, pass it over. But you being in that place where you are... Um, sinking in your Yetzirahara, which is telling you to do something because of a mitzvah, that's a very dangerous place to be. So he says that if Korach would have done this exercise and he would have said, okay, I feel like Moshe is, is abusing his power. Right. Hashem pointed him to be a leader. So the first, as soon as Hashem said, we need a common God, well, Moshe says, well, how about my older brother? Um, and then when, when he needed a Nazi, he said, well, you know, there's a, another one in Shevet Levi who's loyal to me. Can I give him the job? Meaning, he, even if he didn't believe that Moshe made it up, but that Moshe asked Hashem, and Moshe's been making arrangements behind the scene to get the people who are like him, the people who are his followers, to be, uh, to be the leaders. If Korach would have really asked himself, what's motivating you? If he would have looked at himself and said to himself, what's driving me? He would have seen this and walked away from it. But you know what Korach did? He says, he, um, the Pasuk says, Vayikach Korach, ben Yitzar, ben Kahas, ben Levi. And as we pointed out, and Rashi points out the famous Medrash, the famous Gemara, that it doesn't say ben Yaakov. He says, Yaakov is the Midah of Emes. That's why Yaakov's whole life is about challenging his midah of emes. Whatever, you're, whatever you are, Avraham is chesed, so his major challenge is the akeda, which is gevura. Uh, Yaakov, who's the midah of emes, his whole life is a challenge on how he can handle all the sheker around him. But as the Pasik tells us, titen emes li Yaakov, chesed la Avraham. Emes is the midah of Yaakov. So what the verse means is ben Yitzar, ben Kahas, ben Levi, but not ben Yaakov, meaning that he didn't look at the fact that he was ben Yaakov. He refused to recognize that he was um, ben Yaakov. So what, um, meaning that he couldn't look at himself and see the truth within himself. And then the verse continues, v'dasam v'aviram, B'nei Eliyav, V'om Ben Pelas, B'nei Ruvain, and it also doesn't say Ben Yaakov. That all of them, these were people who were acting based on motivation and inspiration as if they're saving the world, but refusing to look at themselves and say, what are you really about? And so he says, that's Vayikach Korach. He, he took 
the fact that he is a Levi. He took the fact that he is inspired and so he took himself, but he took, only took himself so far. So he says that's why the verse leaves out um, Yaakov, but also that's what it means by Yikach Korach, the first explanation, is that Korach took the fact, took only the fact, that he was Ben Yitzar, Ben Kahas, Ben Levi, and not Ben Yaakov. So before we go on to explanation number two, I think this is so, it's so amazing to see how um, the challenges of people don't change. And even though the generation of the Midbar, they're much higher than us, and we are not on their level, and even Korach, we're told that his soul was a great soul, and in the future will be fixed. But still, when we learn these Parshios, we're supposed to listen to these stories and ask ourselves, well, where are we in this area? Have we, are we doing a good job in analyzing ourselves? And when we do get excited and heated about something, how much of that is truly appropriate? And how much of it is our agenda and biases? You know, it seems to me that he wouldn't say Ben Yaakov because everybody was Ben Yaakov. All of Bene Israel at that point Left Mitzray, everybody who went to Mitzrayim was Ben Yaakov. So what kind of yichus does that give him any different than anybody else? I think that's a good point. I mean, but the, that's that's the Gemara, that's Rashi, who quotes that it should have said Ben Yaakov, and you're right. But the, the thing is, why go back to Levi? Everyone knows who Kahas is, and Kahas was the most important family within Shevet Levi. So, I mean... You're right uh, that it, it's saying Ben Levi because he was Levi, but why why quote the Yichus at all? And then once you have the Yichus, it sounds like they should go back to Yaakov. And uh, the Rashi also seems to be reading the question as being from Divre Hayamim, because in Divre Hayamim it does say Ben uh, Kahas, Ben Levi, Ben Yisrael. Okay, the second explanation is a, is a deeper explanation. This is based on a statement in the Yalkut Ruveni in the name of the Zohar. Now, we don't have this text in the Zohar, but the Yalkut Ruveni did have this particular text in the Zohar. The Zohar says, Vayikach Korach, Korach took. What did he take? He took a mana bisha, a broken vessel. That's what the Zohar says. He took a broken vessel. What, what does that mean? So, the Agra de Kala explains. There's a famous teaching of our sages, we've quoted, discussed it recently. This is actually the last of all the Mishnayas that says, Lo matzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kli machsik bracha li Yisrael, Ela HaShalom. That Hashem did not find the vessel that can hold blessing for the Jewish people, only peace. That means when there is peace, when there's shalom, then there can be bracha. Where there is no shalom, where there is no peace, you can't have bracha, you can't have blessing. So he says, where, what is the greatest blessing in the world? Where do we find the most blessing? So we find, we say this in our davening, and Sephardim do it every day, and Ashkenazim at least do it on Yom Tov where HaKadosh Baruch Hu is given a special mitzvah to the Kohanim, es b'nei Yisrael. this is how you should bless the Jewish people, with what we consider to be the greatest verses of blessing, Yivarechacha Hashem v'yishmerecha, Ya'er Hashem panavelacha v'chineka, what we call Berchas Kohanim. And why was this bracha given to Kohanim? Because Aaron HaKohen, who was the first Kohen, it's his descendants who are all the Kohanim, was Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom. He made his life about bringing peace between people. In fact, there are some people who question some of the methods which he took to bring peace between people. It seemed almost a, a little bit dishonest. But to Aaron, everything was about peace. You may have heard the famous pshat on why the Kohen has so much wool and linen mixed together in his clothing, the Kohen Gadol. It's, he's got... Um, in every one of the articles of clothing that he's wearing has is, is got some wool and linen in it, um, the special clothing of the Kohen Gadol. So one of the 
explanations is because wool and linen are of course the offerings that Cain and Hevel brought. Mm-hmm. Cain brought a sheep which is wool and and uh, um, sorry, Hevel brought sheep which is wool and Cain had brought um, flax seed which is linen and so this represent the greatest divisiveness in the world and so we keep wool and linen apart. But the Kohen Gadol who is the symbol he is the instrument of peace amongst the Jewish people. So where he is, there can be wool and linen. That's why tzitzis also, which is a symbol of peace. And in the tzitzis, you can have a mixture. You can have um, linen um, clothing, article of clothing of tzitzis, and you can have wool on the strings, and that's okay, because in this place, there is no, there is no, um, there's no machlokas. Somebody who is a bringer of peace becomes the vessel. That's what the Mishnah means. Kli, lo matzak adosh baruch hu, kli machzik bracha, a vessel that can hold the peace for the Jewish people, is only shalom, meaning people who represent shalom. So people who are peace bringers, people who promote peace, bring a certain amount of bracha, of shefa, of influence, of parnasa, of good things happening, it all happens because people are working on peace. Somebody, this is what the Agra de Kala says, somebody who brings machlokas, someone who brings strife and dispute, is bringing a broken vessel. Is bringing a vessel with holes in it. And even though you can gather all the money in the world and pile it into that vessel, it's leaky, and eventually everything falls out. That's what a Baal Machlokas is. Everything falls apart. People think that Machlokas only destroys and creates divisiveness. It actually does a lot more than that. It makes everything around these people fall apart. So he says, Korach looks like he's coming, with all these amazing arguments. Kikala Eda Kulam Kadoshim. Everyone's holy. When you say Kala Eda Kulam Kadoshim, it sounds like Korach is somebody who's trying to promote equality. And we should all be the same, we should all share the power. But you're trying to bring all these blessings and good things. You're using terms which sound like you're trying to promote something positive. But you're using the method of machlokas. And the Gemara tells us that when somebody does that, not only does he lose what he's trying to achieve, but he loses whatever he had. So Korach, not only, um, not only does he lose what he's trying to get, which is the kahuna, but Korach loses even what he had, which is his family and his wealth, and his most basic identity. So the Akra de Kala says the most wonderful explanation. Vayikach Korach. Korach took. The verse doesn't tell us what he took because the verse doesn't know what he took. He didn't take anything. He was grasping and got nothing. So that's, the, that's why everyone's struggling to find the meaning in this verse he says, because Vayikach Korach, and Korach took something, I'll let you know when we figure out what he took, and we'll finish that sentence. But as for now, he has, doesn't have anything, because he's got a broken vessel. So he's been piling all this stuff into this broken vessel, and ends up with nothing. However, if we can take this a little bit deeper. So you can say Korach was a taker. Right. right. Well, he took. We just don't know. By the way, of the 19, that was explanation number six. Number eight is a similar approach, but a little bit deeper. The holy books tell us, this is also based on the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, that there really is nothing evil. Evil has no existence. Anything that's pure evil on its own has no place in the world. Pure evil simply cannot find a place to rest in the world. 
So what has to happen is all evil needs to rest or attach itself to something good. There's always, in anything evil, there's something good about it. And says the Baal Shem Tov, that's the way to fix the bad thing that's happening. So let's say you have a very bad person in the world. That bad person has, doesn't have any place to exist, cannot exist, unless there's something good. So says the Baal Shem Tov, if you can isolate the good within that person, isolate it and point it out and separate it from the rest, then one of two things are, one of two things are going to happen. Either it will turn all the evil into good, or the evil will completely fall apart. That's what the Baal Shem Tov says. Again, the Baal Shem Tov is saying that there's nothing evil in the world and unless it has something good that it's attaching itself to. So by pointing out and isolating what's good about that object, you can then either nullify all the evil and make it all good, or you can completely destroy all the evil around it. So he says, Korach didn't see any good in his life. Korach was so focused on what he didn't have that, like many people do today, they simply can't focus and recognize what they do have. And this is a problem. The, the classic, the greatest example of this is in the case of Haman. Haman was at the top of the world, almost. He was the prime minister. The king was going to give him whatever he wanted anyway. He was, he was the wealthiest man in the world. Um, it seems like he's offering the king money. So he has more money than the king himself. He has a great family. He's describing all his wives and children and all these things that he has. And he says, and, and not only that, but the king and queen have a private party. And they can't do it without me. We're missing the world's greatest celebrity, Haman himself. What could someone like that complain about? And yet, he utters the most despicable words in, in, in the world that, you know, I went outside, leaving the party, and Mordechai wouldn't bow to me. And he says, All this is worth nothing. Everything he has. He doesn't say, you know, it really gets on my nerves. That's not how... It's worth nothing. I've got nothing if, if I don't have Mordechai bow to me. It's, I've got nothing. How could someone even say those words? It's a complete rejection of any recognition of anything good in his life because of one small thing that happens. And we may think it's very childish because that's how children are, right? Right now they don't have what they want and so it's the end of the world. But all of us to a certain extent do that because if we would think about all the good things that we have, um, you know, like uh, someone said, if you look around in your life, you don't see anything good, check your pulse. <coughs> that might not be good either. Right. <laughs> Hopefully your bl blood pressure is okay. But how can it be that you don't have... So what it is, in order to become that kind of person, you have to be ready to erase everything good that's in your life. And he says that's what happens with Korach here. Korach gets into such a bad place that all there is, is evil. Everything is bad. He says that's what Rashi and Unculus mean, the Ispaleg, Korach, Korach seceded, he separated, but really he divided himself. He took all the good that he had. He was wealthy. He was, um, he was holy. He, was, he had a lot of followers. He had friends. He had people who were listening to him. He had all, Korach had all kinds of things that someone might want. But he, he cut himself. He, I use the word, he partitioned himself and separated the good from the bad. And that's why you see Moshe's response. And Moshe, when they come, he says, Rav Lachem, um, 
exact words. Rav Lachem Bnei Levi, don't you guys have enough? And he says, "I'm at Mikem. Is it not enough for you that God separated you and gave you all these service, and now now you want Kahuna too?" So he says, Moshe is trying to fix them by because all Moshe wants for them to do is to see some good. If they could just see that things are okay, they're good, even though you might still feel you're missing something. But if you could just see that things are okay, things are not bad. Again, it doesn't mean I don't want more, but just see that there are things in life that are really good. What Moshe was expecting was that all the evil should be nullified. It should disappear. Meaning, Korach still might be missing, but this crazy drive that he's having to, like he's got nothing, at least let's fix that. But they refuse to listen. They refuse to listen and they're still pretending like they have nothing. So, Vayikach Korach means Korach took what the word should be is Ra. He took the evil. But because the Torah has already been written and all that Ra has been nullified, the word is gone. But that's the way the Torah was written. But it's Vayikach Korach. There should be a word here. But all that he took was evil. And evil has no existence on its own. And by the, the, and partitioning himself in this way, the Ispalei Korach, Korach divided himself, so there simply isn't there that half of him that he took. And that's why the word is not there. He says uh, an interesting remez to this, because the, uh, um, the word Rasha, is made up of a resh, a shin, and an ayin. The resh and the ayin, on the two ends, are ra, are evil. And the rasha only has a, an existence as long as that shin is there. Shin is usually a letter representing holiness that, and, and truth. That's why shin is the first letter in the word sheker. Because we know that unless you start with a truth, you can never finish a lie. That's what we learned in last week's parsha. That these spies show up and they say, oh, it's a good night. That's the shin. And the rest is the kuf and the reish. The kar, the coldness, the calculated um, lies which follow after the shin. So that shin in the word rasha is that good that's there. And when you can remove the shin from the word rasha, you're left with the reish and ayin, which is the pure evil, which then separates. He says, this is why you'll find that in so many places, it says that you should destroy the teeth of the rasha. Shine rishaim shibarto, you should break the teeth of the rasha. And even in the Haggadah, we have hake es shino. So says the Agra de Kala, it's not the shin of the tooth, but it's the shin in the word rasha. And blunt that shin, separate the good, remove that, and what you'll be left with is the resh and the ayin, which, if done in one way, will cause all the evil to turn towards the good, and if done in another way, will cause all the evil to disappear, without getting into the mechanics of which way happens um, with what. So once again, it's a similar explanation, but a lot deeper. Before we were saying that he took, but he didn't take anything, because it was all spilling out. Now we're saying, no, he took the ra, Except Ra has no existence. And so, um, through this process that Moshe does, Moshe um, destroys all that Ra. And so the word, so to speak, isn't there because that word has been removed. All within the context of the story. However, in his 19th explanation, if we have time for this, he goes back to but there's another word which we use. We say Hashem Yevarech Es Amo Bashalom. As we end Shmona Esrei, there's actually the last word in Shmona Esrei. Hamavarech Es Amo Yisrael Bashalom. Afterwards is Elokai So there's something very special about the word Bashalom. Bashalom is the numerical value of three hundred and 78, which is the same numerical value as the word chashmal. <laughs> a chashmal, 
is not just the modern Hebrew word for electricity, but it's actually based on a verse in Yechezkel, and actually the authors of modern Hebrew kind of mocked Tanakh in a certain way by taking some of the deepest and holiest words and inserting them and giving them a Monday meaning. Um, right, the Chayos Aratz Veshov Kamari Habazak. Is a the, uh, describes the angels and their traveling and how they move. But th the reason why, I mean, they were very clever. They didn't just pick random words and, and do it like that. But the Gemara says, um, you should know that the, the, when the word Chashmal appears in the book of Yechezkel, Rashi says, and I quote, I don't have permission to explain this verse. It's the, in, in, in all of Tanakh, all 24 books, Rashi never says, I don't have permission except in this verse, when it comes to the, to the angel Chashmal, and it's based on the Gemara in Chagiga, the Gemara talks about this, um, uh, this young child who, who um, understood the, what the Chashmal was, and he ended up dying, and the Gemara says, therefore, don't talk about Chashmal, don't learn about Chashmal, just kind of skip over it, which is why Rashi says, I don't have permission to explain this verse. But then the next line, the Gemara is new, so what's Chashmal? <laughs> My Chashmal. So one of the explanations in the Gemara is this angel is itim chashashos, chashos, itim mamalalos. The chashmal is made up of two words. Chash, to speak. I'm sorry, chash, to be silent. And mal, to speak. Like the word lachash means to whisper. So chash is to be silent. And mal is like um, milim, like words, means to speak. So this angel which has, as the Gemara explains, has like a positive and neg negative polar opposites. It speaks and is silent at the same time. It goes back and forth and runs positive and negative, which is why they use that word for electricity. Chashemal, speaking and silent at the same time, representing positive and negative. Um, so they were clever about it, but still they chose to use the word. As one uh, great rabbi said, that they were hoping to take one of the holiest words, one of the names of the angels, and get people to use that word in the bathroom. Yeah, that was that was their goal to, to take the holiness out of it. Anyway, whether that's true or not, so he says that whatever is in the heavens above exists in the world below. So we have the servants of Hashem, the Kohanim and the Leviim. The Kohanim, everything is in silence and whispers. The Ketores is all indoors, everything is inside, in that room, hidden away, concealed. The Kohen Gadol, when he goes in, everything is hidden away. No one can look, no one can go in that chamber. The Kohanim represent Chash. While the Levim, they open the doors. They're the singers. They are the Mal. Between the Kohanim and the Levim together, you get Chash Mal. He says, this is why you've never heard an explanation like this. But this is why there's two Shmon Esrei's. The silent Shmon Esrei and the repetition. The silent Shmon Esrei represents the Chash and the repetition represents the Mal. The silent Shmon Esrei is you as a Kohen who is um, um, speaking in private, so to speak, in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And then the Chazara Sashatz is the same exact words being processed out loud and shared B'tzibor as a community as a whole. Because there is the service of Hashem in the realm of Chashmal. Korach was a Levi. And therefore his job is, as we, um, is um, to be the singers, to be Lam Natseach Levnei Korach, Mizmor Shir. That was the, the fixing of the sons of Korach, mm -hmm. that they wrote these chapters in Tehillim, recognizing that their role is supposed to be as the singers, as the speakers, as the ones who express words. And instead, he decided that he wants to change his whole existence and become a chash, to become the quiet, silent um, um, servant of God. You can't make this stuff up. But Korach, Kuf, Reish, Ches, is 308, which is Chash. Vayikach Korach says that he took, he took the 
chash, the 308, meaning that that's what he was trying to grab onto. He was trying to hold onto the chash, which is the silence, the quiet servant of God. That's Vayikach Korach, as if it says Vayikach Chash, which is the same numerical value as Bashalom, as we said before. Because Bashalom means peace, where you can balance the Chash versus the Mal, where you can balance the positive and the negative, the quiet Shmon Esrei and the loud Shmon Esrei, and when you can bring people together, and when you can bring people together, then somehow, the people who speak and the people are silent are not a contradiction. It's always good when you have people who are together, when you have some people who like to talk and some people who like to listen. It's hard to have a conversation when, with two people who just like to listen. And it's hard to, even harder to have a conversation with two people who like to talk. It's easy to have a relationship where one person is at this point giving and the other one is receiving, and then sometimes the other one's giving, the other one's receiving. But if everyone is just giving and no one's willing to accept, or if everyone's willing to take, which is probably worse, but no one's willing to give, you can't have that. What we need is chashmal, which is the balance between the positives and the negatives. We need the kohanim versus the levim. When a Levi tries to be a Kohen, it sets off the Shalom. And you see this in the fact that for the sake of his own ascent or attempt to rise, he's willing to create discord and fighting between the Jewish people. So he's not Shalom. He doesn't represent peace. Gemara tells us that there's two kinds of Machlokas. There's a Machlokas L'Shem Shamayim. And there's a machlokas shelo l'shem, the Mishnah and Avos. Right? What, what, what do we call a machlokas that's l'shem shamayim? The machlokas between Shammai and Hillel. The machlokas and the Gemara and the machlokas that's shelo l'shem shamayim is Korach v'adas. So what do we say about a machlokas that's l'shem shamayim? It endures. It endures. We want the machlokas to endure. I should say it's positive. It's a good thing. We encourage it. But to say that it will endure, while the machlokas says shalom l'shem shemayim will not endure, why do we use that term? The answer is because we need balance in the world. You do need machlokas. You need Beis Hillel and you need Beis Shammai. You need Chash and you need Mal. You need the givers and the takers and the speakers and the listeners. You need the people who are more quiet. You need the people who are more active. You need the people who are making noise and you need the people who are following. You need leaders and followers. You need all that. That's not a problem. So it endures because the world needs that kind of balance. Because you know what the greatest level of shalom is? You know what the word shamayim is? The word shamayim is a combination of the words esh and mayim. Esh and mayim are opposites. But in shamayim they come together because we're not asking people to agree with each other and do everything the same way. We're asking people to get along and to recognize each other and each person play their role to be who they need to be. But when someone steps out of that, when someone says, I am a mal and I want to be a chash, that's vayikach korach. At that point, everything falls apart. At that point, it's no longer bashalom, it's machlokes. And that cannot endure because it has no existence. It has no place in the world. It is outside the plan of Hashem. Hashem made us all different to be different people. But if there is no peace, nothing exists. It's the broken vessel. And that's why, that's why, Vayikach Korach, Many of these explanations run along the same theme. Vayikach Korach, and it doesn't say what he took, because we can't find it. It's not there. It's broken, and it's gone, and it doesn't exist. It doesn't matter what he took. It doesn't, it's not even there what he took, because it doesn't endure. It's not real. And what we're looking for in, in, is for us, like it says by the Duchan, when it, when it does trace Korach's Yichus all the way to Yisrael, that's talking about the children of Korach who become the singers in the Beis HaMikdash. 
there, where they are the singers, where they're playing who they are, then it's Ben Levi, Ben Yisrael. It traces it back to Yaakov. Because the key to all peace is for us to be truthful about where we're coming from and what we're feeling. And that's very hard to really know who we are and what we are and what we're thinking and what we're really wanting and what our real motivations are. And that was the mistake with Korach. And so Vayikach Korach, Korach took nothing. May we take this lesson and hopefully we think more about what our real motivations are and realize that all of us are different, all of us have different purposes in the world, but together we can work together to be Mubarak Hasamar Bashalam through Oiv Shalom and Shalom. And may we merit a world where all of us become whole vessels and bring as much blessing to the world as can be. Thank you.